morning, everyone. I was watching that countdown clock, and then I saw it disappear, and then I love this. Please place your phones on worship mode. <laughs> that is fantastic. I'm not sure there is that mode. So, anyway, uh, welcome to the Edmonds Unitarian Universalist Congregation Sunday morning worship service. Uh, my name is Joseph Ednarek. I am a relatively tall, relatively uh, bald, white man with glasses, currently wearing a suit with a very colorful flowery tie. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I am your guest preacher for today. And one of the great pieces of good news for today is today is an all ages service, which means that people of all ages will be uh, entirely within the sanctuary today. Um, and I just want to do a quick uh, survey, a quick check. Um, please raise your hand if you have ever been eight years old. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Now please raise your hand if you are under 10 years old. Got a couple. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So everybody here, my guess, has either been eight or about to be eight, or you're eight, or you're close to eight. <laughs> you are all welcome here. Um, and also, as we begin, you have detected, as we began this morning, that we have some very special music um, going on this morning, and that's the String Fever Players. And I would love to have a round of applause for the string <laughs> Peter folks. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, whether you are in the sanctuary or attending online this morning, your presence is an essential part of our worship service this morning. And we're gathering as one congregation here in Edmonds, Washington, and online uh, with curious minds, loving hearts, deep and varied beliefs and unique life stories. And we're all growing, we're all learning, we're all loved just as we are, and everyone is welcome here. Uh, if this is your first or second Sunday here at EUUC, um, please let us help connect with you um, and with the people and activities uh, that you're hoping to find in a faith community. Uh, if you're on site this morning, you are welcome to find me after the service, and I will put you in touch with someone who can give you more information uh, about EUUC. If you're online this morning, uh, please go to the website, euuc.org, and you can click on the link that says, I'm new, and that will open up all sorts of portals of information. Now, after the service, uh, many of us who are here um, we'll enjoy coffee hour. Is that still outside and around the corner? No, I'm getting ahead. Is there coffee hour? There is coffee hour just over there. Fantastic. And just another detail question, is there still a Zoom virtual coffee hour? Nodded yes. Okay. After the service, if you would like to join the Zoom coffee hour, you are welcome to do so. Uh, if you are new to the service online, uh, please go to that I'm new link and sign up to attend the next coffee hour. I hope I got that right administratively. Got a lot of head nods here in the congregation, that's great. So this morning uh, and every morning, let us remember that our congregational home is placed here on the lands of the Snohomish people uh, who have inhabited this region of the Salish Sea since time immemorial uh, and who continue their livelihoods on these lands today. Uh, may we all live and learn humbly as allies to the Snohomish. And now our opening words this morning are beautiful words that I encourage you to take in and remember uh, at about 4.30 this afternoon because uh, they're just gorgeous. And this is from, these are from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Our goal should be to live life in radical amazement. Get up in the morning and look at the world in a way that takes nothing for granted. Everything is phenomenal. Everything is incredible. Never treat life casually. To be spiritual 
is to be amazed. I just love that line. To be spiritual is to be amazed. So during our time together this morning, um, let's really try to be together in radical amazement. And each week we gather, we also place a flame uh, inside the bowl of a chalice. Uh, and this is committing and complementing a sign and a signal of our Unitarian Universalist faith tradition. And as we spring forward toward the vernal equinox, and I want to congratulate you. Wow, spring forward, y'all made it today. This is fantastic. Um, we're going to light the chalice with these words uh, from the extraordinary novelist Edith Wharton. There are two ways of spreading light to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. And our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 195, Let Us Wander Where We Will. Um, you're welcome to rise as you're willing and able. Masks on and sing away. the time for our congregational affirmation, uh, please join me in saying aloud these words. We need each other, and so we come to this place to work and dance and laugh and cry and think. We call ourselves a religious community, not because this place is in itself holy ground, but because what we do here say here and are here, make it so, so let it be. And I also just like to point out that one of the, one of the phrases in the affirmation is that second line, to work and dance and laugh and cry and think. And so this morning, we are going to do our level best to make sure all those things happen that we think, that we cry, that we laugh, we work, and there's going to be an opportunity later in the service for you to dance. And so you're going to get to live your values by dancing here in the congregation. And this morning's sermon uh, is called Postcards from Your Spiritual Journey. And for this time for all ages, I wanted to share 
uh, a story about postcards because the word postcard is one of my favorite words uh, in the world. Uh, as you may know, uh, back in the pre-internet days, postcards, there still exist, postcards still exist. They're essentially small little cards, usually with a picture on one side and on the other side there's a blank space to write a message or draw a picture or do a painting or something. You can write a message um, to your friends or your family. Um, and there's also a little place for a mailing address so you can send the postcard through the physical mail. Uh, before, before smartphones and texting and Instagram and Facebook and all those ways that you can stay in touch, um, postcards were a phenomenal way to stay in touch. And I love that phrase, stay in touch. So let's think of postcards as these wonderful and fun and creative stay in touch tools. Um, and I for one love getting postcards in the mail uh, and what I call the real mail. Uh, and I've got one friend who sends me lots and lots and lots and lots of postcards. Um, this friend lives in Portland. He actually has um, been to events dressed as Dumbledore and people get very confused because they actually think they're in the presence of Dumbledore. Um, he reads for hours and hours every day in his comfy chair, a cat on his lap, and next to him is a stack of postcards. And so whenever he gets inspired, he jots down a message to a friend uh, and he sends it off. And I am happy to be on his list of postcard friends. And here's a pile of postcards that I have received over the past year from him. And this is just part of the file. I just randomly grabbed it and took a photograph. Um, and what's interesting, sometimes the postcard doesn't have everything that he wants to say. So we'll say one of three, and then I'll write another one, <laughs> two of three. <laughs> and so I get these postcards in the mail, and sometimes they don't arrive on the same day. And I'm like, what are you, what's going on? Um, and he signs off. The thing I love about uh, his postcards is he signs off very explicitly to tell me that he loves me. And here I went through that pile, and here are just a short list of the ways that he expresses uh, his love for his friend. Hoping you're well. Much love. Ja love. One love. With love and dama. Be well, my friend. Love to all. XOXO with love and spices. <laughs> now when I get a postcard from my friend, I feel good. I feel our friendship, and I feel our love for one another. And he writes me way more postcards than I write him, and he's assured me that that's absolutely okay. Uh, it's important for him to write out these messages, to stick stamps on, and to walk to the post office to send the card. It helps him be in the world. Uh, and he does not expect anything in return. Now the joy for him is in the process of writing and sending and reaching out. And that said, I occasionally will send him a big stack of blank postcards and a couple of sheets of <laughs> postcard stamps, because I want to stay on his good side, right? I want to keep this thing rolling. And while most postcards are printed with pictures, and I want to show you some of my favorite postcards, like this. This is an old vintage postcard of the Deception Pass Bridge. This is my favorite postcard in the entire world. <laughs> this is some fisherman holding a fish called a muskie. And when I was a little kid, when I was 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, I was completely in muskie fever, and I wanted to catch one of these fish. Um, and this postcard existed at the bait shop where I would go to visit before I would go fishing. I never caught a muskie. Um, and I, when I was in a, oh, hold on for one second. Back to the muskie. So the muskie guy, I went back to the, this bait shop when I was, I don't know, 25 or 26, because I remembered this postcard. And they had a stack of them. And I just bought every postcard. <laughs> So that's a, if you, that's a classic, that's a Joseph classic. And the other thing I love about this postcard, and granted it's a, it's a, um, a brand, but you can see the red Pegasus up there, and Pegasus as a symbol of poetry. So I consider the muskie the most poetic fish. <laughs> and then the next postcard, I love this one, the water skiing clowns. 
you know, whew, off into the Zoom. And sometimes people will make their own postcards. Um, I recently told somebody who I love that I was working on a sermon called Postcards from Your Spiritual Journey. Um, that's what we'll be hearing a little later. And they said, oh man, that sounds like fun. And I said, well, you're invited to join the fun. And I invited them to send me a postcard from their spiritual journey. And so a week or so later, I received this post, well, not that, no, not that, that. Yeah, exactly. So you can look at this, you can watch this, and you can ponder this little image for a very long time and still keep seeing things. Those teeny tiny words around the middle black circle, they read, you are here. <laughs> and you realize that that's the most important part of any spiritual journey, right? That you're actually here so you can embark upon the journey. And then there's that big white field, that circular field, and then these rings that radiate around that white field. Um, and the radiation is, or the radiating rings are over this thicket, this colorful thicket of images. And if you look close at those images, you can see the rings of a tree, you can see leaves, you can see a bicycle wheel, a turtle, um, images on top of images on top of images. And I just love this postcard. And so, to, and, it's, and it literally exists on a piece of paper that's very, very small. So you can fit a lot into a small space. Uh, and to conclude this morning, I invite you to listen to the message on the back of the card. And it reads as follows. Hello, dear one. This postcard is for you. Yes, you. I hope it finds you healthy and safe wherever you may be. I'm writing you from the eye of my own brainstorm. The still, quiet set circle at my center created by the spinning weight of it all. The circle that holds me and reminds me that I am whole, that you are too. The eye that sees the rings of a tree trunk on the ridges of your fingertip. The big shade-giving tree and its tiny seed the sun in a dandelion flower, the truth in a googly eye, and the divine beauty of the storm. And they pointed out that that center section also, for them, looks like a big googly eye. And uh, for their metaphysics contains googly eyes. I'm not quite sure why. And they sign off the card with this beautiful sign off, big love, and then they draw a radiating heart like that at the base of their signature. That's kind of their classic sign-off. And where the address goes, it just says, you here now. <laughs> you here now. And again, best place in the whole universe to reflect on any journey, spiritual otherwise, is right now and right here. So to those who uh, have been eight in the past and those who are either eight or becoming eight, I thank you very much for your attention during time for all ages. Uh, and I also want to let you know that this morning um, we have within the sanctuary some blank postcards. So children, if you would like to make a postcard this morning, you're absolutely welcome to do so. Um, and you can be inspired to draw on it, write a message, and then send it off to a friend or family. And those children who are online, uh, if you would take this time to write in your name and address, someone here will send you a postcard, and that will help us all keep in touch. That was so much fun. <laughs> Thank you. Don't you just love that musky postcard? Aren't you going to think of that all day long, that guy? I'd love to talk with him. It's a big musky. Um, and now's the time in our service where we get to enter into uh, some silent meditation. Um, we enter, well, hold on for one second. Where are those blank postcards? Who's got the blank postcards? They are out in the Okay. Okay. So out in the narthex underneath the memorial, someone's going to go grab them. And if you want a 
postcard, just please raise your hand and someone will give you up. Oh, we got, we got, whoop, whoop, whoop. We've got some people who want some postcards, so we'll be right with you, all right? Fantastic. Thank you very much. And so now's the time in our service when we get to enter into some silent meditation. Um, we are going to enter this time with these words. May solace come upon you, power rise within you, and peace settle on your heart. So, our special music this morning is When Irish Eyes Are Smiling, played by String Fever. Special music this morning is in your ears. Oh, my, my apologies. Ah, my apologies. Thank you. 
few weeks, well, first of all, before we start, does everybody have a postcard who wants a postcard? Anybody else want to raise their hand? We got one there. We have, you have your postcard? You got a postcard there. We want one over here. The musicians want one, of course. Dear friends, I'm here in a sanctuary playing harp music. Thank you. Look at this. Wonderful. Postcards are not email. Yes. <laughs> I'd rather have a mailbox full of postcards than a mailbox full of email, with all due respect. So a few weeks ago, I shared a conversation with this elderly gentleman uh, who's preparing to celebrate his 90th birthday. Uh, and part of his preparation for that birthday is to quote unquote downsize, to rid himself of some physical stuff. And now while discussing his deliberate process of how he's moving the things out of his life, uh, he said this gorgeous sentence that I'm going to share with you. I want to write my spiritual journey. How glorious, I thought. And I wondered whether the release of physical objects provided the necessary mental space and the creative drive to consider spiritual matters. Because more than inheriting a teapot made by some famous potter or a book published in 1874, I am certain that his family would much rather have a memoir of his spiritual journey written in his own words. And reflecting on that ambitious statement, I want to write my spiritual journey, I came to realize that our individual and our specific and our idiosyncratic spiritual journeys, they might be the deepest realms of our autobiography, of our lived experience on this planet. What's one of your stories? I asked this elderly gentleman. And then I said, imagine writing me a postcard from along the way. Well, he said, As so as we begin this morning's sermon uh, called Postcards from Your Spiritual Journey, I'd like to share with you a verbal postcard um, that's going to help frame our time together. This morning, I recently presented a sermon at another Unitarian Universalist congregation um, wherein I used these two foundational aspects of classical mathematics to help illustrate some broader religious points. Um, and the concepts mentioned were that the simple fact that parallel lines never meet. And the second one was the transitive property of equality, where if A equals B and B equals C, then A is going to equal C. And these are bedrock math, uh, provided the foundation for this, I considered a pretty fun sermon. Uh, we played with the idea of the metaphorical equal sign, and we compared the wisdom statements of Jesus and Buddha and Lao Tzu. Uh, for example, here are two wisdom statements uh, that find home in the golden rule file. This is from Jesus. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And here's the Buddha. Consider others as yourself. And here's these two parallel statements. And it sounds like a dreamy Sunday morning, doesn't it? <laughs> but remember that this story is set in a Unitarian Universalist congregation. We just spent 20 minutes interweaving the bedrock math and religious wisdom, and immediately after the sermon, a retired doctor met me at the pulpit and said, you know, you're not quite right about that equal sign. <laughs> and I was heartened that he softened the message by saying that I wasn't quite right, um, rather than informing me that I was flat out wrong. Um, and at UU congregations, I am no stranger to being absolutely wrong. Uh, it comes with the territory. You're welcome to meet me outside at coffee hour. Um, and our good doctor continued, you know, in quantum mathematics, A doesn't necessarily equal C. Now his eyes were just sparkling as I welcomed the feedback. And I said that I needed to brush up on my quantum mathematics. <laughs> and then at coffee hour, a retired professor approached me 
And she said, rough quote, you know, in, U the in the Euclidean world, parallel lines never meet, but in quantum mathematics, <laughs> it suggests that parallel lines may meet. Her eyes were sparkling <laughs> as I welcomed the feedback and said that I needed to brush up on my quantum mechanics. And again, how wonderful, I thought. Even the certainty of an equal sign and that parallel lines, quote unquote, never meet. None of this is certain in a Unitarian Universalist congregation. <laughs> um, what those sparkling eyes of the doctor and the professor betrayed is that delight, the absolute delight in broadening the context and reminding us that what we see with our own eyes, with our own mind, may not necessarily reflect ultimate reality. Now that's a very platonic notion, ultimate reality, capital U, ultimate, capital R, reality, uh, perhaps better stated as quantum reality, uh, because there are vast universes of thought and experience and imagination that your brain, that your heart, and that your soul have yet to visit, yet to register, yet to perceive or comprehend. And this is an invitation to an exhilarating and a radical humility, which, if practiced well, puts you on the same team as the wisest person who ever walked the earth, and that's Socrates. And the trick to why he was the wisest was because he knew that he didn't know. And yet he persisted in asking deep questions in philosophizing, in creating dialogue, uh, and asking questions of his fellow citizens in Athens to the point of becoming so annoying <laughs> to the power structures that the state decided that it was best to execute Socrates. So the word of the day this Sunday morning is quantum. And true to my word about brushing up on quantum, all the realms quantum, I, after I arrived home from that church service, I went to my office and I pulled down the one book that I knew that I had in my library that had quantum in the title. And the title is The Quantum Bigfoot. <laughs> As in Sasquatch, yes. Since I was a little boy of eight, uh, I had had a soft spot in my heart for Bigfoot. Um, and as a mature adult, I have gathered together many, many books about Bigfoot. And a few years ago, I actually attended a lecture from a quote-unquote Bigfoot researcher. <laughs> Hilarious. This, research, this researcher, his uh, sp uh, little presentation was inside a thrift store. And he was set up right near the door of the thrift store, and there was a bell on the door so every time a customer came in to go buy a cup or an ashtray, it was bling, 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 and everyone would look to see who came in. It was very intimidating. I'm glad that this door doesn't have a bell on it and people just walk in during the church service. Anyway, I've gathered a bunch of materials about um, Bigfoot, and after his lecture, I decided to buy all of his books and his CD uh, of Bigfoot sounds that he recorded. <laughs> Um, because I wanted to help him along the way to financially support his research. Uh, and someday I'm going to do a sermon on Bigfoot. Uh, though this morning I'm only going to quote from a book called The Quantum Bigfoot. Quote, In this book I am persuaded to present a reasonable correlation between the rules of quantum science as the foundation of spirituality and how it could relate to these creatures known as Bigfoot. And did you catch that? The rules of quantum science as the foundation for spirituality. Which brings us to that very famous quote from Einstein, who was no stranger to the word quantum. Quote, the most beautiful emotion that we can experience is the mystical. It is the power 
of all true art and science, they to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand in rapt awe, is as good as dead. To know that what is impenetrable to us really exists, manifesting itself as the highest wisdom and the most radiant beauty, which our dull faculties can comprehend only in their most primitive forms, this knowledge, this feeling, is at the center of true religiousness. In this sense, and in this sense only, I belong to the rank of devoutly religious people. There's Einstein. I love to think of Einstein standing at the edge of mystery. So the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mystical. It is the power of all true art and science. And I just want to share with you that I recently witnessed firsthand the mystical come to life before my very eyes. Postcard number one. My neighbor, I'm going to call him Mr. X, was taking his morning walk around the block. Now, Mr. X is an ex-Marine. He's an ex-psychology teacher. He's an ex-back to the lander. He's tough as nails. He drinks strong cocktails every evening. He rides a bicycle. He likes to kayak. He soaks most days in his hot tub. He plays a mean banjo and guitar, and he is a devout atheist who teases me relentlessly <laughs> about attending church. Hey, Mr. X, I said when I saw him, how's it going? He stopped walking, looked in my direction. Everything is so beautiful, he said. This did not sound like Mr. X. <laughs> now please know it was an average winter morning on the Olympic Peninsula. The sun was playing peekaboo behind clouds. There was a gray mist in the air, the temperature cool. What's beautiful, I asked as I crossed the street to be near him. Everything, everything, I'm just I'm just overwhelmed by it. Look, look at that branch. Look at that branch. It's beautiful. Now with his cane, he pointed to a leafless cherry tree, which in a few months will be festooned with blossoms and then with the help of pollinators eventually have these gorgeous red globes of cherries. And I could see that Mr. X's eyes were rimmed with tears. And I instinctively knew that I was in the presence of a human being having a profound experience, what I will call a spiritual experience. We were not atop the Himalayas. We were not practicing yoga in an ashram. We were not walking a labyrinth at Chartres Cathedral. We were neighbors standing side by side along the edge of a road in early January, gray mist in the air, admiring the beauty of a bare cherry tree branch. And an old man's eyes were filling with tears because the world was so utterly, fabulously, profoundly beautiful. And I chose to be silent to not respond with words. To simply be with my neighbor. To bear witness to what was happening. To nod at the words that he decided to share. Just look at that branch. Now I could have been in the presence of William Blake or St. Teresa, or Rumi. Now the branch was beautiful. Though truth be told, I was looking with my eyes while Mr. X was seeing with his whole being. Seeing the branch with his eyes brimming with tears. 
the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mystical. It is the power of all true art and science. Postcard number two. This past fall, a young person I know was hospitalized for 10 days uh, with a manic episode. They had never experienced mania before. And while in the hospital, they experienced a psychotic break. Eventually, they were diagnosed with bipolar disorder type 1. Classic case, said the psychiatrist. Now, this is all new territory for them. And after being released from the hospital, I had the opportunity to spend a day with them uh, and to listen to their stories about how they're trying to figure out what happened, how to stay grounded, how to manage the new regimes of medicine and therapy, and what lies ahead. Now, they also shared that their mania was a profound experience, what they called a spiritual experience. Now, other people in their life, those who are helping this person through their hospitalization, doctors, nurses, loved ones, always called the phenomenon mania. And mania was always a symptom of mental illness. Now, this person who's new to the game bristles at the phrase mental illness, though they never want to return to the depression that preceded the mania, the depression in which they suffered for the first time in their life, suicidal ideation. Their words, quote, in the hospital, my favorite therapy sessions were called music therapy, where we would just listen to music. When I got out of the hospital, I was listening to music as part of therapy. And this song came up on my feed, this song I had never heard before by an artist I didn't know. But after the last note faded, I pressed repeat on my phone. And I listened again. Press repeat again. Repeat again. Repeat again. Repeat again. I just loved that song. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> definitely. I definitely want to hear that song. And so they beseech the internet gods to send the song through their phone by pressing play. My favorite button on the planet, by the way, play. Doesn't necessarily have to be music. And then sound just filled the air. It was a vaguely familiar guitar. And then the lyrics started. And I instantly recognized the words. This was an incredibly obscure song by an independent folk singer out of Milwaukee. And the opening lyrics go like this. Inside the tunnels, the stone tunnels are the trains. And inside the trains, the steel trains are the bags of skin. And inside the thin skin are the blood and the bones. And inside the blood and the bones are the dreams. It really is that simple. It really is that fragile. I am one such dream inside the blood and the bones and the bags and the trains and the tunnels. There's a dream sitting next to me. There's a dream across from me. Fragile. I love that song, I said. And then I shared this with this person who had just discovered the song. I saw that folk singer, this is me talking, I saw that folk singer at a live gig at a very small venue in Port Townsend. Uh, after the show, I bought a stack of his CDs to help him, like I did with the Bigfoot researcher. Bought a stack of CDs to help him on their way. And on a recent road trip, I took one of the CDs, selected at random, and I was listening to it while rolling down Highway 101. And after that song that you just played appeared on the CD, I pressed repeat over and over and over again. And I probably listened to it 10 or 12 times in a row, just like you were doing 3,000 miles away. Now, given the timing, we might have been pressing repeat at the very same moment. How quantum is that? <laughs> now the song is called Dreams, 
by Peter Mulvey, and it ends with these lyrics. We all know that one day the tunnels will crumble and the trains will stop and the blood and the bags and the bones will be gone. And in between now and then, something will happen to all the dreams. I don't know what will happen to the other dreams, but I know what will happen to me. Sure as rain, I know. Sure as winter, I'll breathe and I'll grieve and struggle and strive and love, love. And if I'm lucky, once, just once, the dream will drop to the floor like a vase and shatter in shards of silence where I will see, I will see in the pattern of the pieces, I will see something. This will, this will happen. But now the train with all its fragile cargo rolls on. Now one aspect of the song that my friend loved was the line, where I will see, I will see in the pattern of the pieces, I will see something. Because in their mania, they saw patterns everywhere. They were able to make connections where there were formerly none to make, where there were no discernible connections prior to the mania. Now this is a classic symptom of mania, these making of connections. And perhaps it is in a manic state when the seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism reveals itself most vividly, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Again, Einstein, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mystical. It's the power of all true art and science. And now, the final postcard, postcard number three, a story from your spiritual journey. Perhaps, perhaps, you were like millions of people with addictions to drugs or alcohol who entered treatment and began working the 12 steps. If you're sober and clean, you can likely tell us a vivid story of a spiritual experience along your journey to sobriety, which is a spiritual journey if ever there was one. Perhaps you took LSD at a Grateful Dead concert and danced like a whirling dervish and became the heartbeat of the universe. Perhaps you sat in Zen meditation and experienced that initial awakening called Kensho. Perhaps the world opened up at the birth of your child. Perhaps the world opened up at the death of your spouse. I know an attorney in Los Angeles who was the victim of a violent crime who after emerging from a coma, gave up his law practice, changed his name, traveled to India to search for deeper meanings. Decades later, at his memorial service at a Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which was standing room only, the love expressed by those in mourning, profound. Perhaps you dove into a cold river after soaking in a hot spring, and that quick change got you to overdrive alive. Perhaps this morning you sipped tea and actually tasted the tea. Perhaps, 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 the possibilities, absolutely endless. Now to quote the French philosopher and Jesuit priest Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, quote, and this is for uh, string fever, in honor of string fever, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Just look at that branch. Amen. I was wrong with what song we were going to play for special music, so what song are we going to play now? <laughs>
Merrily, oh wow, Merrily Kiss the Quaker. And this is where we dance. This is where you get to live your values of dancing. Yes. Right on. Merrily Kiss the Quaker. All of you Checking my pulse. <laughs> I'm a little elevated. It's okay. That was wonderful. That was very quantum. <laughs> very good. So, a kind word or a thoughtful act, like a pebble dropped in water, sends ripples out into the world. Uh, should you wish to make a promise or let go of one, remember someone, release a bit of pain. Forgive yourself or someone else or otherwise mark an important event or occasion. Um, this is the time in our service we can step forward uh, and quietly send our thoughts and our feelings outward as we drop pebbles into the water, uh, mingling the ripples of your intention with the ripples of other people in our community. Uh, during this quiet time, please feel free to come forward, uh, maintain physical distance, uh, I guess that rule's really out the door after we dance with the Quaker. <laughs> You're welcome to get as snug as you wish, look back, um, and place a pebble in the water. I hope the COVID committee is not here and heard me. And I, I might get fired. Um, I will drop a pebble at the beginning for those who wish they were here uh, but are not, and another for those who wish, um, wish the best for the world. How's that?
it is always such an honor to be in the presence of joys and of sorrows. Now is one of my favorite times in any worship service, and that's the offering. Uh, if you're new to our gathering, uh, it's important for you to know that all of the EUUC's weekly offering goes out into the world um, to help support other organizations that help advance our mission. Uh, the Sunday offerings that we collect, um, they financially support the organizations who are doing good work that align with the mission of this congregation, which is gathering together, nurturing the spirit, and living our vision of a just and sustainable world. Uh, if you're online or on site and you have a phone in your hand, you can go to the giving tab at the website euuc.org and look for the offering cause of the month. Uh, if you're on site and have cash or a check, uh, there's a basket out in the narthex uh, where you can contribute. Uh, just go through the doors, do a 180, uh, and then there's a basket underneath the big screen. Uh, we're not passing the baskets uh, because of COVID. Uh, please be generous within the limits of your budget. And with the words, or word, offering in mind, um, we're delighted to be sharing the news that the cause of the month for March is the South Snohomish County Emergency Cold Weather Shelter. Um, this cold weather shelter, it's a volunteer-run organization, provides a warm place to sleep and a hot meal to anyone when nights are cold. Uh, they, provide, they provide houseless individuals with safety, warmth, a full stomach, and hospitality and compassion. Uh, their shelter has moved many times, but they're currently located at Maple Park Church in Linwood. Uh, the shelter is opened on those nights when the temperature drops below 35 degrees, uh, and this year the shelter uh, experienced significant increase in demand uh, for their critical services. Again, the majority of the labor uh, is provided by volunteers and partner organizations, um, and while this has worked generally well in the past, um, the safe operating constraints because of COVID and the unanticipated demand due to the increased cold weather uh, has exceeded the shelter's financial capacity. Uh, and therefore, the funds that we contribute this month will go directly to their operating budget uh, to cover uh, two staff people and to also pay for skilled janitorial services in order to make the place safe um, for infection or against infections. Uh, as always, if you have an organization that you wish um, to nominate for the Sunday Cause of the Month, uh, we invite you to fill out that form um, on, on our website. Uh, we do have a few announcements today. And does anybody want to hear an announcement about the auction? The auction. Does anyone want to hear about the auction? The auction. Anybody there? Hey, we've got an announcement. Yeah. Yeah. So, tickets to the live auction. It will be held here in Chapman Hall on Sunday, April 2nd uh, at 12.30, noon 30. Um, those tickets are on sale today in the Narthex. Uh, the $25 ticket price includes a catered Bach lunch from Panera uh, and an afternoon of fun with the EUUC committee. Kids are free. Just keep their hands down when the bidding starts. Right? <laughs> Uh, one time when I was a kid, I one time attended an auction and I spent like $30 for a Beach Boys album. My dad's like, why do you keep lifting your hand? It's like, for the Ronald McDonald House, Dad. For the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, if you're at home, you can purchase a ticket online at the website. Uh, click Donate, and then there'll be a drop-down menu to donate to auction tickets, and then you can fill out the form there. Uh, and if you wish to volunteer at the auction, uh, please see Nancy Gladow in the Narthex. Second announcement is the Giving Garden needs your help. Uh, it's time to break ground for this year's Giving Garden. Uh, if we're going to be able to share the produce with local food banks, help is needed. Uh, at this point, volunteers have been meeting on Monday mornings to work in the garden, but we're also considering switching to Sundays. Uh, please stop by the social justice desk after the service uh, to learn more. This announcement from the Peace and Justice Committee uh, trees have always been an integral part of Northwest life, uh, and we need to do what we can to protect them. Uh, 
join Kate Lunsford for a tree talk on Friday, March 24, at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Um, and you can get the link for that. And there's an email here that I'm going to read. Hopefully you can remember. Peace and Justice, all one word, dot RSVP at EUUC.org. That is fantastic. It's very consistent with Unitarian Universalist worship services. <laughs> that what I say and what you see just do not match. If you want to go to this tree talk, I trust that you can find the information, the correct information somewhere. <laughs> so. It's on Thursday. It's on Thursday. OK. Does anybody, is this, can someone confirm that this is the correct information? No. Yes. <laughs> Tastes great. Less filling. No. Yes. Perfect. It's Thursday? Thursday. Okay. Someone concurs. An eight year old concurs with eight. An eight year old concurs, so it's done. It's Thursday. Now that was a quantum announcement. I'm gonna, that's okay. Anyway, so now next Sun, I'm assuming this next announcement will be correct. <laughs> next Sunday, March 19, uh, at 11.45, uh, the Advocates for Women invite you to hear congregation members of different ages and genders uh, relate personal stories on family planning, reproductive health care, and support for raising healthy families. Uh, these stories from the heart, um, they will help you understand the importance of the proposed reproductive justice stand. A snack will be provided. And then there's another long email that's up there. No, yeah, that's up there that you can uh, write down. I'm assuming that is not, I, I swear to uh, God or not God, this is exactly the situation. I have a different email address than what is being shown up there. So I'm not even wading into that territory. So that was a lot of fun. And there was a lot going on here at this congregation, so that's fantastic. But now we are getting to bring this service to a close. Um, We're going to uh, re-enter the world. And we do so with uh, a short poem by Antonio Machado. Beyond living and dreaming, what matters most is waking up. And now we release this flame and retain the light of truth. We release this flame and we retain the warmth of community. We release this flame and retain the fire of commitment. Let us each and all carry truth's light, community's warmth, and commitment's fire in our hearts until we gather together again. And our postlude? Is it my wild Irish rose? Yes. I got it. <laughs>